Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining for this COVID-19 update and media conference. We will be addressed by Prime Minister, the Honorable Mia Amor Motley, the Minister of Health and Wellness, Lieutenant Colonel, the Honorable Jeffrey Bostick, Infectious Disease Specialist and Isolation Facilities Manager, Dr. Corey Ford, and Consultant Manager of Home Isolation, Dr. Adana Grandison. And Minister Bostick will begin. Thank you. Lisa, good afternoon, everyone. I would like to start my brief today by giving you the figures for the number of tests completed and the positive cases that resulted from those tests. So yesterday, we would have done 2,555 tests at the Best Dos Santos lab. And those tests produced 427 new positives. 427 new positives, of which 70, 70 are under the age of 18. 70 under the age of 18. And I start with this because obviously, I don't have to tell you that this is indeed a high number. But it's a, is a a high number that those of us in the Ministry of Health would have been anticipating because the fact that we have been consistently above 300 for several days, this really was kind of inevitable and it certainly will continue to present some challenges for us, but challenges which we will work assiduously to overcome. I also need to state that within today's figures, the largest cluster of cases would have been from the psychiatric hospital, for which we now have another outbreak. 63 cases today, and about 46 cases that we would have had yesterday. Dr. Ford is going to go into the details in relation to the psychiatric hospital. But I just want to say that this is something that we have had to do before, not only at the psychiatric hospital. We've been dealing with a situation at the geriatric hospital or St. Michael District Hospital. And we've also been dealing with two elderly care facilities all at the same time. But I'm happy to report that given what has happened at these other facilities that I have the greatest confidence in Dr. Ford and his team to be able to successfully manage this developing situation. Now, I will say something to you because I know that there's been some chat in relation to the recent change of the protocols for persons coming into Barbados. And I know that after today's results that you're probably asking what madness it is that we're doing. And I understand. I understand because from where you sit, you really would not have all of the information that I have. And I want to give you the assurance and I'm going to take some time to explain this situation to the press as well as the public to demonstrate to you that there really is method in what you may consider to be madness. When we started this journey several months ago, we started with some protocols which we've had to adjust as things develop, as new situations emerge. We would have started, for example, with having persons in home quarantine. That is how we had to start. And we then changed from that to mandatory quarantine in quarantine facilities designated by the Ministry of Health and Wellness. Now we are back to a situation where we have persons again in home quarantine. We started with facilities for isolation, and we are at the point now where we have introduced home isolation. And I say that to indicate to you that this is a very dynamic situation, a very complex and complicated situation that we're dealing with. 
and we have to fight the battle where the bat battle has to be fought. I am advised that when the number of cases coming from travelers account for about 10% of your case incidents, that that is when countries generally are expected and encouraged to tighten protocols, 10%. For the last three months or so, we have not been seeing a lot of positives coming out of Grantley Adams International Airport. And if I can give you an example or two, in August, we would have had about 18,000 persons visiting. And we had a positivity rate of persons with non-Barbadian ID cards, and that is how we identify those. And I will explain something about that, of less than 1%. In fact, 0.66%. Same thing, September and October, less than 1%. 0.53, That is what we have been seeing coming out of the travelers coming into Barbados. But even some of those cases are persons who actually reside here, who, but who are non-nationals and do not carry Barbadian ID cards. Some of the cases are also travelers who would have tested positive for their departure test, or, or in other words, a test that they're required to get back into their country or to wherever they, else they're, they're going on to. And interestingly enough, if you look at the number of positive cases that we've been having over the last six weeks or so, and you this idea that you will utilize one day's result. I want to put it to you that one day's result of positive cases of the community transmission, persons who reside in Barbados, accounted for more than the total cases for one month of persons traveling into the country. And that is the reality. So we are facing with a situation where the main thrust, the main effort, the main battle that we've been fighting for months, which really was at the airport, the port of entry, because the focus, the aim at that point in time was to try to keep the virus out of the country, keep the variants out of the country, or delay them, because we always recognize that we were not going to be able to stop COVID from entering this country, just like any other country in the, world, in the world. So that that was the main effort. But when we move to a situation that we are in at this point of serious community transmission, the vast majority of our positive cases are within our communities. So the main effort, our battlefield has shifted from the port of entry to the communities we do not have infinite resources in this country. Our human resources capacity, that is stretched at this time because of this surge that we, we are experiencing. And also our material resources. We have to look at swabs and tests and reagents and all the kits and all the things that are required because this is a protracted war, a prolonged effort is required here. So it it was a simple task of really determining exactly where we needed to place our main effort. And the main effort really is the community. And community testing resulting from the high number of positive cases that we've been getting over the last several days. So that it would have been foolhardy to leave a vital asset at the airport to test people that are yielding a very low positivity rate when the real issue that we have is within our communities. So the decision was taken to reallocate some of those resources, the vast majority, to the community to be able to carry out the testing and perhaps the increased testing that will result from the numbers that we have. So what we are trying to do, because driving around, when, especially when I visit or pass by the, Branford Tate Polyclinic, the Eunice Gibson Polyclinic, the gymnasium testing site, 
those three in particular, which bear the brunt of the testing of Barbadians and persons residing here. The, the snaking around the highway and so on and around buildings that I've been observing, the large numbers, really was not a comfortable feeling, feeling for me. Not from a public health perspective, nor from the perspective of trying to make things comfortable for Barbadians who have to utilize those services. And we didn't want to have a situation where people would have been standing in the line waiting for so long under those conditions, especially when a lot of these persons might have been persons who were exposed primary contacts, and then they decided to go back home because they couldn't wait any longer. So we've had to make some decisions, tough decisions, but in my view, the right decisions. So we're looking to expand our testing capacity with, for community transmission persons who, who need testing by having another two or three sites for testing, including Queen's Park, which is centrally located and easily accessible to persons. We will announce the other sites later. We, we have to go in that direction to take some of the load off of the major testing sites, the two polyclinics mentioned and the gymnasium. And we also have to engage the services in some instances with our private sector partners for them to be able to assist with testing to reduce the numbers, reduce the waiting time, and also to take some of the burden off of the resources that we have at our disposal. That is the public sector resources. So that is the rationale for the change of the protocol at the airport. It is also a part of a new testing strategy that we are developing and will be rolling out shortly. And we are doing so not only because of our own experience, but acting under the advice of a virologist from PAHO that was sent out here on two occasions to assist us with um, training people to test, to swab, and also to give advice on the things that we are doing within the Best Dos Santos Public Health Laboratory. And so this is part of that process. Now, it does not mean that if the situation warrants in time to come, that we would not go back to testing at the airport because this, as I said, is a dynamic situation. But we have to deal with the current situation and the area of greatest threat to the country. And that area is within communities, expanding community testing by having additional sites, and we needed to use the resources at the airport. So basically, that is the rationale for doing what we have done, which is to change that protocol. I also want to add that the requirement for a negative PCR test 72 hours prior to arrival in this country is still on the cards. That is mandatory. And that is going to continue until we have to change it if we have to at any other point in time in this pandemic, during this pandemic. I also want to indicate to you that outside of the persons who arrive in Barbados with not the standard test that we expect, and so we have to continue to test those persons, and we will have a small team at the airport, that generally speaking, apart from the fully vaccinated travelers, the resources we had at the airport were only testing between 50 and 70 persons per day outside of fully vaccinated travelers. This process did not start here with the fully vaccinated travelers. Those persons who are not fully vaccinated and who are required to do five days in quarantine, initially you would recall all persons had to do a test on arrival, then they would go to quarantine, and then on day five, they will have to do a second test or an exit test to be able to leave quarantine. We took the decision earlier not to test unvaccinated people on arrival once they have a negative PCR test, but to allow them to go straight to hotel designated quarantine, and then we would test them on day five. So these are all of the things that we've had to do. We have to manage the resources we have prudently. We have to ensure that our human resources are not burnt out and stretched to the extent that they cannot help us for the next battle. Because this is, a, as I said, this is a prolonged and protracted war. So we have to pace ourselves. And so that is the rationale for that. I want to alert you early 
that as a result of this, you will see an increase in the positivity rate, the daily positivity rate. And why? It's because the low number of persons testing positive on arrival or travelers to Barbados and, and the amount of tests that were required to be able to do that. Once we remove that testing, it will have an impact on the positivity rate because we will be testing a, a smaller number of persons coming in and also we, the fact that those persons will not be positive cases for the most part. The most positive cases will continue to be persons um, as a result of community transmission. So those are the things that I wanted to, to share with you. I, I think that you should understand why we have taken that decision. It was nothing that we just did willy-nilly. It was carefully thought out. All part of the plans that we have for the surge, because we've been planning and planning and planning, and even as we are executing this current mission, we are still planning for the next surge in time to come. So with those few remarks, I would now like to hand over to Dr. Corey Ford. Corey. Good evening, Barbadians. I am not clad in my normal um, outfit. Um, I really came from the field, but to give you an idea. But uh, before I continue any further, before I continue any further in speaking, I would like to first give thanks to Almighty God for the strength, the willpower of the staff on the ground in this fight for this country. It is difficult, and certainly it has been a difficult time for every single person in country. I just want to also at this point, before again I give any figures or numbers, to especially thank the staff today across all the isolation facilities including in our primary isolation unit, which I know has been under a lot of pressure, certainly in terms of modern numbers. But in saying all of that, I will continue to say this. Yes, I would have spoken to the country about four or five weeks ago and said we were going through a storm, and certainly we are there in the midst of the storm. But I want to encourage all Barbadians who listen to me today in saying that we certainly are not giving up. Certainly we will never give up. We all have to fight as Barbadians through this battle. All is not lost, despite all of the challenges that we're faced with on a daily basis. I want to assure Barbadians that I have a strong, tenacious, young group of people on the ground who will continue to fight a battle for this country, even in these difficult times. And we will never give up, despite all the challenges that have been mentioned. And despite the high numbers in the country that one would have seen today, it is nothing that really was unexpected. As I told you four weeks ago, this is something that certainly was expected. But I think the most important part of what I have to say is that you, as the average Barbadian, have an opportunity to help us in getting these numbers down. It's the things that you will do on the ground that will impact change. It's those out there who are not vaccinated and rethinking what they do that will help us on the ground. So I say that, and I also say that I'm also very thankful for all of you out there who certainly have been praying for the team, and I really thank you for the encouragement and, and be assured that this is something that I do pass on to the staff. And I'll give you an idea of what's going on on the ground, because I know you're interested. And I, I first want to start off with something that is very encouraging, and that, and, and it is that over the last few weeks, we were able to go in one nursing home in the country with many ill people or, or people who I used to say were positive for COVID. Unfortunately, we were able to go in that nursing home and we left it in the way that we got it, that we were able to save the lives of many older Barbadians, of which many of all of them, for the most part, were vaccinated. And I think that this is important for the country to understand that although we're going through difficult times, we have had serious successes in the battle. And there will be challenges ahead, I know. But I want to assure you that we will put our best foot forward even within those challenges. So we are here together today, today in recognizing that we've had another nursing home which has been infiltrated by COVID-19. 
But again, all is not lost. I personally reviewed all the patients in that facility, and there were only two patients of concern, and I think both of them um, seem to be doing much better. And I wish them better, and I wish um, you know, their families to understand that we are doing all we can as we moved into that facility in Takatova. And the battle continued, and certainly continued today, certainly with the numbers that we face. But I think one must also recognize that if we, if we pulled out a large amount of those cases from today, from our case numbers, we will recognize that many of those cases were centered around the cluster seen in psychiatry hospital. And with that, I will give you an idea of exactly what's going on within that area. So in the Grassfield ward of psychiatry hospital, of the 56 persons who were tested, 43 were positive. Of the C ward, of a total of 65 patients tested, as a result of contact tracing, 64 of those were found to be infected. In terms of the amount of staff affected um, with COVID are found positive, a total of 12 staff members were infected. But I say that this is obviously a tough battle. But what I will tell you is we've been here before. We've been into psychiatric hospital and nothing beats experience. So nothing beats the experience of having been there before. Of course, we're different, dealing with a different version of this virus, which is Delta, which we know spreads a bit more, and we know is a bit more deadly. But I think the most important thing I want to assure you of here is that we will do every single thing that we can do possible to help those who cannot help themselves, whether vaccinated, unvaccinated, whether black, whether white, whether Asian, whatever you come from, whatever nature of life you come from, whether you have a psychiatric illness or you don't have a psychiatric illness, whether you're old or whether you're young, we will put our best foot forward. But we can only do so much. Some of the responsibility, I think, as well, in your own personal management depends on what you do as the average citizen. So I encourage you in that. And with that, I will move on to the other facilities across this country. So we all know about Harrison's Point, And as Harrison's Point stands at this particular time, we have a large influx of patients into our primary isolation area. This is primary isolation A, and then primary isolation B, which was recently um, renamed as isolation B from secondary isolation, which is the previous name. And it's really because of the sort of, of ingenuity which occurred. So we um, um, certainly, um, um, the prime minister, I think, was, was really the big, the big lead behind this and trying to, to push to get that area fully oxygenated in, in secondary, which really makes it into primary, which I honestly believe, as I sit here today, that if we did not have that in place, that we would probably be in a bit more trouble in this country. I thought it was one of the master moves, certainly, of this particular outbreak. But in saying that, I would say that my colleagues there are working extremely hard. Things are not easy. It is not difficult. It's not you know, easy times um, for all of us. Um, but I want to encourage them. Um, those my, my medical consultant colleagues who are there, Dr. Hassel and Dr. Lovell, I can't say much more than the, to thanks and for my anesthetic colleagues who've come in to help. I also want to thank, take the opportunity to thank those from the Department of Internal Medicine who have poured sweat and blood in terms of working in there in some very long hours, but also take the opportunity as we speak about ICU and uh, uh, the other issues across this country to mention as well many of my um, colleagues in internal medicine um, this is not a quarry for a job. This is a country job. This is a, a consultant job. This is a physicians coming together, in my opinion, um, to protect this country in one of the most dangerous times I think we face. And I just want to take the opportunity to thank many of the medical consultants. I can't call all of your names because I probably would be, be here till evening um, call, call, calling them. But I just wanted to give you, while I'm on this, a great appreciation for what you have done. And certainly a man in Black Mongolop in the HDU, you there, all of you know who you are. Uh, and also um, certainly helping at Queen's College and Sambay Hotel, which we have patients. And the secondary issue, let's give you an idea of, of, of the sort of, 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 you know, when, 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 often when we say, you know, we're having a challenge, or there are many patients, I don't think anybody understands how difficult it is to manage the sheer amount of ill people who we have on the ground. And we do have 31 people in primary isolation A. Um, 20 of them are basically on non-invasive ventilation. So ma imagine doctors have to manage 20 patients there. Nine, pa nine of them are intubated. Um, the others are on oxygen, and they can go back and forth between those. In our primary isolation B, we have a total of two patients on non-invasive ventilation and 11 of them on oxygen. I think that this is important to understand. This is, these are difficult times, and I mean, 
I, I don't know what else to tell you today as I look straight into the camera, but to say that you listening on have a role. I think every average Barbadian today has to understand that these are difficult times. I look at the numbers and of course the numbers are high, but I always tell my colleagues and some people squint at me when I say this, but it's important. I tell them it's not the numbers that bother me. Yes, the numbers can be high. I can have a population. I don't want to go here. It's not where I wanted to go, but I'm going to go there because I always take instructions from above. And I will say, on occasions, people just focus on numbers. So I can have a thousand cases. Let's make it as simple as possible. I can have a thousand cases. And if I have 10 of them who are sick, we can manage. If I have 20 of them who can sit, we can manage. I think probably if I had a hundred of them, is that we can manage. And we can, we can manage that because we have the medical capacity to do that. And I, in my head, I know from all the international data, I see there's some new data that came out today, which speaks about people being vaccinated. And the majority of them, not all, the majority, right? For the most part, about 93% plus, will come out fine. They will have mild to moderate symptoms. Some will have none. Some may get moderate illness and a small majority of them might get ill. And we know that, right? We know that as fact. But if I have a thousand people and I don't stretch my healthcare system, then we will live happy, we'll get back to normal. That's, that's just all of us want to be back to normal. But my problem with this is if I have a large percentage or even you know, 300 or 400 of those being unvaccinated, it puts pressure on the system because if they get sick, including that little piece of 7%, and I add that 400%, 400 people to it, sorry, then we're going to have a challenge. So I'm using this opportunity again, again, as we go through the midst of the storm. If we really want to get to the eye of the storm and make it cross the other side, it's going to only be dependent on us who are fighting on the ground. I want to assure you we are. With all of my heart this evening, we are. But if we're going to get to the other side, it's going to take a large response from the general public in this country. And I'm going to give you a challenge this evening. Not planned, but from above. I can give you a challenge, right? I'm going to give the country a challenge that you get this country before the, I don't want to give dates, but by the middle of next month, I would love every single Barbadian who has the opportunity to get vaccinated to help us on the ground, to help our challenge on the ground. I really would like you to step forward and do it by the 15th, call in a date, I may be wrong for doing that PM, but by the 15th of November, I am pleading with all Barbadians in this country to add wisdom and common sense to your daily living. If you're not sure, pray to God, he can give you the answer, right? And I'm, I sure know what the answer is because he's speaking to me as I speak to you, right? I'm asking you to protect the healthcare workers and protect this country. There is no one more in this country than I who want this country to get back to any sense of normalcy. I want to fly back on planes. I want to have a long vacation, as I always say at the end of this. I want to be able to do all the things that you want to do or you would do before. I gave some good examples at one of the, one of the, the isolation centers to the patients that made them last, but I wouldn't say on national TV. I want to get back to all the lovely things that we did before. And we can get there, but it will take you to act. I just want to thank you for the opportunity for giving, for giving this update. And please remember by what I said just now. By the 15th of November, I'm asking for as many Barbadians as possible to step forward in this fight. I don't want to see a 1,000 cases in this country or 800 or 900 or whatever is predicted. And we have the capacity to get there and to do that and to return to normalcy. Thank you. For Dr. Grandison will make a presentation. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for having us again at this press conference. Good. So before I start to give the numbers for this evening for home isolation, as I am looking at the current dashboard, I wanted to first start off echoing what Dr. Corey Ford has said. Um, I, I need to because I've, I've been working with them since we've started from September 30th, and I think um, it would be very inappropriate of me to not thank my staff. Um, they have been working 24 hours around the clock. Um, these would be our medical assessors, our home assessors, persons who are working at the operations center, persons who came on and are now working at our call center, 
this is a collective effort and I want to say on behalf of home isolation I want to thank you on behalf of Barbados because I think that for any person who's in home isolation they can appreciate the efforts that uh, you are making so that's first of all I want to say thanks um, the, since the home isolation program has started um, we have had thousands of persons within the program but currently we have 4,698 total persons out in community of which there are nine which I'm actually quite proud to smile and say we have single digits in terms of our very emergent cases out in community at this point in time and we expect that those persons would be removed from community within maximum of approximately two hours then we have our yellow persons who are persons that we based upon either the symptomatology pattern that they have or their comorbidity status um, certain or even for social reasons we think that they would need to have a closer review um, at an isolation facility and currently we have 344 of them out in community but I am proud to say for the majority of my Barbadians and visitors who are within the home isolation program, they are actually safe. I have 2,470 persons who are currently safe within our facilities, within, within home isolation, sorry. Um, from the start of the program, we've had 907 persons who have been transported to these facilities, as well as 212 persons who were already in facilities at the point of contact. But there are a few concerns that I do have. Right now, we have 373 persons who have refused transportation and escalation of medical care. And I want to appeal to all Barbadians, please. I know that there are some persons who are very scared or think there is a, a need to be scared to go into an isolation facility like Harrison Point, Black Mongolop, Sambay, any of the facilities across the island. But I want to remind you that this, these facilities, I should say, are the best equipped facilities that we have on the island to manage COVID positive patients. This assessment does not always necessarily mean that you will have to stay at the facility, but the beautiful thing about being able to have an assessment at the facility is that if the healthcare workers at the facility think that from a clinical standpoint that you require an escalation of care, they can provide the necessary care that you need at that time. The reason why we attempt to flag persons either red or yellow is because we want for you to get the necessary care that you need early. So I'm appealing to all persons if you are con and when you are contacted by a healthcare professional and they have deemed that you may require a closer look or more emergent care that you comply and you agree to be transported to a central isolation facility to be assessed and to be monitored and to get the requisite care that you need. Since our program has started, we've had one death, unfortunately, uh, and that death has occurred within the last week on the 15th of October. And unfortunately, it was a person who refused transportation and escalation of care. This bothers me a lot. Um, I chose medicine certainly because I like helping persons and it bothers me to see that I lose even one. Even one for me is too much. And I am just appealing again to all Barbadians, please, when you are flagged, take the transport, get the necessary care that you need. If Dr. Ford and his team thinks that you are safe to come back out after they have assessed you, they will call us and they will tell us, okay, safe for retransfer back to home isolation. And it has happened with a number of persons. There is also um, the issue, because this is an evolving situation of NIS claims. I know there are a lot of persons who are concerned about NIS claims at this point in time, but I want to reassure you that we are moving towards an automated electronic format to provide you with the NIS form that you will need 
to ensure that you get your claim and you are able to be comfortable. I know this is quite a difficult time for those who are in isolation. They're concerned about how their needs will be met. And I want to reassure you this evening that we are looking into that and we will resolve it. In addition to that, in an attempt to continue to build out capacity because we have so many people out in community, um, we are in the very last phase of actually retrofitting what we are calling our red bus. And this is a bus essentially that is able to sit six persons who require oxygen so that in the event we need to transport more than one person. I know a lot of persons can bear witness to the fact that sometimes we may not always have all of the ambulance um, provisions that we may need. And so we thought it necessary, especially for our COVID positive patients, to provide them with an additional mode of transportation that they can get safely from home to the central isolation facility. And we are days away from that red bus um, actually starting to provide services to the public. I also want to encourage Barbadians at this point in time to remember this number, 536-1800. This is the number for COVID positive patients. And when I say COVID positive patients, I'm referring to persons who have tested positive on a PCR test. These are our confirmed COVID positive patients. Now, I know that there are a number of you who may have taken a rapid antigen test and may have tested positive on that test. And I would have hoped that that test you would have taken simply because you were symptomatic. But I want to remind you that it is important for you to follow the next step, which is once found rapid positive, to actually take a PCR test to confirm your status. And if at any point in time you are having any change in symptomatology or worsening in your symptom presentation, please do not hesitate to call this number. It is a 24-hour hotline, but we have dedicated this line for COVID-positive patients. And to the best news so far, we have successfully discharged 1,273 persons from home isolation as of today. And as Dr. Ford stated, um, this is an ever-evolving situation. We are currently continuing discussions about um, how we will continue to build out capacity, given the fact that we know that we are not at the peak of positivities as of today, and, and we know that we are still in the middle of what Dr. Ford quite nicely calls the storm, and he's quite, he's quite true. And, and so I want to encourage persons, given the fact that we are still in the storm, we still have Delta currently in circulation, apart from going and get vaccinated, I'm going to add on a bit to Dr. Ford, what Dr. Ford said. Please continue to practice the non-pharmacologic measures. Please continue to wear your mask. I know a lot of persons in Barbados, we are very sociable people. And sometimes we think that it is not always important to wear a mask, even within our household. If you have a COVID positive person within your household, even if you may have a separate bedroom, a separate bathroom, at any point in time when you're interacting with that person, please wear your mask and wear it properly. Continue to wash your hands and sanitize your areas and wherever possible, stand six feet away from each other. At this point in time, I'm going to pass over to uh, the PM. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Grandison. The Prime Minister will address the country at this time. Thank you very much, <coughs> Lisa. Um, Minister Bostick, Dr. Corey Ford, Dr. Dana Grandison, Barbadians, visitors, everyone, um, good afternoon. And let me start by saying, really, how proud I am of, of, of the people who we have working for us. Um, you've already heard this afternoon from three people who are on the front line of the battle, leading from the front, and who have indicated exactly where we are in this storm. Um, we have said always that we are not to be surprised by what we expect. 
and over the course of the last few months we've been preparing the country for the reality that we are going to face a surge but that we need to protect ourselves to come out of it as best we can and that is why from day one we've always said to you our mission is about saving lives and reducing hospitalization and that is effectively what you've heard from these doctors again this evening regrettably we've learned that we have a situation at the psychiatric hospital and the truth is that we are waiting to get more details but there is no doubt that the 40 something persons yesterday and 66 today constitute a large number of the cases from yesterday and today and i have my own suspicions but we will await because the last time i checked people don't go out and get covid very often when they're in these institutions and we have to find a way of how best we can protect them that is why we've spoken before about the safe zones and i'll come to that before i finish this evening but if there is one thing that you continue to hear from everyone who has spoken it is the need for us to accept personal responsibility the truth is that the government has done and is doing what it can but the real difference in the battle will come by individual persons doing what they must do and you know i wonder sometimes and marvel that that old bajan saying one one blow is kill old cow as a recognition that we each need to do what we must do to protect ourselves and, and let us be very clear when we were fighting the battle against tobacco and i feel qualified to speak to this as a former smoker it is when people reduced it to the message that smoking kills and people started to take individual responsibility for their health that we started to see a reduction in the number of smokers and in almost every other instance we went through the whole hiv and aids and other stds and it is only when people accept personal responsibility that we begin to turn the corner in these things the personal responsibility of which i speak is not just the wearing of the mask it's not just the the, the the social distancing the physical distancing it's not just the hand sanitizing but it is also as we've learned the vaccinations and and if you ask us what makes this different jeffrey from the first and the second wave it is that 146,000 barbadians are now vaccinated and therefore when you hear dr ford speak about the fact that even if the cases are rising so long as we can manage the numbers especially among those who are unvaccinated that is what will determine whether our health system can manage or not and mercifully it has been challenged but it is not yet overwhelmed and we hope that it will not get there we have taken anticipatory decisions recognizing that this is what we would face the first of course came in the construction of harrison's point but the second has come with the expansion of a primary b um, primary facility um, B, which Dr. Ford spoke about just now. And the third is actually about to happen where we are also ensuring that if there is further overflow, we can deal with it. And why? COVID is not going anywhere. I've said over and over, this is a marathon. And I'm not speaking about Barbados now. I'm speaking about the entire world in which we live. And even as we speak, we see the experiences of countries as they fight up. But the one sure thing that we're also seeing from country to country too is regrettably something called COVID fatigue and mental fatigue. And we therefore have to work with people where they are. The minister spoke absolutely clearly and cogently this afternoon about why we must take the battle to where the battle really is. And it is no sense deploying resources to fight a battle that is non-existent at our border, um, at our ports of entry when in truth and in fact it is in the middle of, 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 of the country. Similarly, if we were to go on lockdown now as some have been calling for, what does that do? As we've discussed over and over, all it does is to drive people in to other areas to hide and to congregate because at the end of the day, the battle that must be won is not the lockdown. The battle that must be won is the individual determination to protect each of ourselves and to act as though we love ourselves and love those around us. And if I had to say in one sentence, what is it that is required of you and each of us? For each of us to protect ourselves and to protect those that we love. I cannot say it in many other ways because it is simple. 
And, and the battle that is required, you heard it from Corey, you heard it from Adana, you heard it from Jeffrey, you heard it from me, you've heard it from others before, you heard it from David Ellison, you heard it from Dr. Ferdinand yesterday. And, and, and the truth is that this is the conversation that we're going to keep having. And there's some people, I hear you, you're tired hearing us. Sometimes I'm tired talking too. But the reality is that we have to keep talking. And we have to keep talking because until we can save as many lives as possible, that is our solemn duty. But we talk knowing full well that there is no single policy measure that the government can execute. There is no single economic measure that what is required now more than ever is for us to do the right thing and to be able to, one, where possible, please vaccinate. And secondly, continue to follow the other protocols. And why are we saying this? Let me share something with you. Between the 21st of August and the 21st of October last year, look at the numbers that we did in this country. On the 21st of August, we had vaccinated at least one dose in 101,983 people. I want to repeat myself. 101,983 people. Yesterday, two months later, we have vaccinated now 146,103 persons. This country has vaccinated 45,000 people in the last two months. And therefore, when Dr. Ford issues a challenge, he went for a month, just under a month, I hope you can do better for him than you've done for me and that you can give us another 45,000 in that month instead of two. And why do I say so? Because if we get another 45,000 Barbadians vaccinated with a first dose and then ultimately the second dose, then what we have effectively done is to reach 70% of our adult population and more than 83, 84%, I believe, of the eligible population. And that is exactly where we need to go. Because when the doctors tell us about this thing being endemic, what, what are they really telling us? They're telling us that we got to learn to live with it. And we learn to live with it by protecting ourselves first, by minimizing the chances of catching it. But secondly, that if we catch it, that it just becomes something that we can shake off because it is not going to attack fundamentally our organs in a way to cause us to either be seriously hospitalized or to die. And that is what is required. It is as easy as that, but it is as complex as each person having to take the decision. And we all know that people are capable of exercising their own free will. If you want us to be able to get back to where we need to go, then we need to take personal responsibility. And I ask myself often that this is a country where good old time reasoning, good old time common sense has worked for us in the past. And if we don't make the decisions to one, protect ourselves first, and then by what we do, to be able to limit what we do, to be able to ensure that we act in a responsible manner, then we are likely to become victims of this. And, 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 and it is as simple as that. If you want to walk about, you're not vaccinated, and you're mixing up with people, and not wearing a mask, Day does fall and night, however which way you look at it, and night is fall a day, you will reap what you sow. And let us be clear now that that is what lies ahead of us. And to lock down Barbados in circumstances where 146,000 people, 64% of the eligible population, have already taken this vaccine, are already protecting themselves, are already ensuring that we will not overwhelm our health system, then I say to the rest of us, please, let us apply our hearts to wisdom. And as to why we are not mandating, I repeat myself again. The bottom line is, is that for whatever reason, there are people who cannot take it, either because of medical reasons or serious philosophical reasons. In those circumstances, we are saying that we accept that the only way to the destination is not vaccines. We accept that testing can also give us an idea of safety. But we know it is cumbersome. And because we know it is cumbersome, we will guarantee you in your workplace. That is why we talk about the safe zones. I'm informed by the Minister of Health that, that the work that was done and the consultations that have been done with respect to the healthcare workers and with respect to the healthcare institutions and nursing homes, I've actually seen the draft um, that they were able to complete. We've sent it to PAHO, and it is our anticipation 
that we will be in a position to have that safe zone in healthcare institutions and workers by the 1st of November operational. When I spoke to you on the last occasion, I also told you that we were looking at other frontline workers for the guidance notes to come as well. And those other frontline workers will be police, prison officers, soldiers, um, customs and immigration. And then of course the main one for us, which is in fact our hotel and tourism workers and, and um, workers in restaurants used predominantly in the tourism sector, as well as tourism attractions. And why are we saying this? My friends, we have to get back to normal. The bottom line is that if you look at our numbers in our, our economy, Barbados can only start to sustain itself if we can get tourism moving again. And the bottom line also is, is that for the majority of the last 20 months, we have seen in excess of a 90% decline in the persons visiting. We know that it affects us because you've seen from the farmers to the manufacturers to the retailers complaining that business is down, largely because we do not have enough people on island eating, drinking, and moving around and doing the things that are necessary to keep us going. What is of significance to us is that in September and October is the first time we are beginning to see the corner and turn the corner with respect to, to what we've been facing. And we know that as bad as COVID Recording is, in progress. we know that as bad as COVID is, that we are literally in the process of, 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 of recognizing that it is not the only thing out there that is either killing Barbadians or that is affecting Barbadians. And therefore, we do not have the luxury of a one-issue country. I've said so over and over and over. And we have now to recognize that we have to continue to get Barbadians working again. We have to continue to get this country earning again. And if we're going to pay the bills that we need to pay, we need to be able to make sure that as many people are working and, and, and benefiting as possible. Now that means living with COVID. Why? Because Dr. Ford cannot tell me when COVID gone done. Dr. Grandison can't tell me when COVID gone done. Minister Bostick can't tell me when COVID gone done. So that unless you expect to stay in a state of paralysis, we have to learn to live with it. But guess what? Dr. Ford can't tell me when dengue gone done either. Dr. Granison can't tell me when chicken pox and shingles gone done. And Minister Bostick can't tell me when the flu gone done. And all of these things are chronic NCDs. And all of these things continue to be responsible for lives. But it doesn't stop us from living. And it doesn't stop us from working. And it doesn't stop us from doing the things that we need to do. Now, I am satisfied that Bajans can do this. And we are a small enough nation. And why am I talking? Because when we talk with each other, we can settle the common mission, which is to save lives. Which is to reduce serious hospitalization which is to get people working as far as possible again, but at the same time, to do so in a way that is as safe as possible. And, and that is why, even as we speak, as I said, November 1st, for the safe zones, for the healthcare workers, and I hope that we can start rolling out the other frontline workers from the 7th of November, with each week going further and further, particularly the tourism and the hospitality workers, because of the catalytic impact that that has on so many other sectors and so many other opportunities for people to get jobs in this country, to be able to feed their families and to be able to take care of themselves. My friends, this is where we are, but guess what? We are no different from any other country, any other part of the world. And this is just our reality in today's world in the same way that in previous centuries, people have had the same reality. I ask us, please, Please, it is not beyond us to understand reason and common sense. And we can do this together willingly, as opposed to us having to take drastic measures as a government that will affect both the righteous and the unrighteous, that will affect the working and the not working, that will affect the vaccinated and the unvaccinated. I am satisfied that in the same way we were able to achieve almost 45,000 vaccinations in the last two months, that we can in the next four to eight weeks achieve the same 45,000 vaccinations. Corey, 
I am coming and giving them a little time behind you. But there's nothing that would make me happier than to say that Corey Bet get win over mine. I would be the happiest woman in the world. And why? Because we need to get our country moving again. We had a saying that tourism is our business, but COVID reconstruction is our business. And I'm not even talking about post-COVID because there is no post-COVID. We have to reconstruct during COVID. And that's the message that I'm trying to give us. And let us put it in context. Barbados has had about 14,000 COVID cases, just around 14,000. We have a population of about 280,000. The bottom line is, is that the majority of people have not necessarily caught it, although there is a view, and I don't doubt it, that there are others out there who we have not been able to capture who have had it. Bottom line, however, is that our duty is to get those who are very, very sick, and that is why the red zone people and the yellow zone people, and however the doctors are choosing to call it, are so critical. I want to thank those doctors, nurses, orderlies, transport people, soldiers, um, all of the frontline people. Believe you me, I continue to be proud of our people each and every day. And we know it is rough, but we also know that we are doing better than most. And I'm asking us to continue to stay focused because this is the only way we know how to do it. And for those who have taken and wondering about their children, let's have a conversation. Because let us be clear that it makes no sense you taking the vaccine and knowing that you have a teenager who living in the house with you, but you ain't letting them take it, when the evidence is very clear that it is safe for them to take it. And, and, the, and, 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 and let's deal with the vaccines globally. More than half the world's population, it is true that they've got a lot of countries who ain't get vaccines yet, but more than half the world's population have taken it. And that's why... In asking you now to step up to the plate, I am so happy and would like formally to thank the government of the United States of America and in particular President Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris. I met with Vice President Harris just last week and in um, that period of time we indicated we had about to run out of our first tranche which we did of Kaiser last week. We were indicating to them that we need to get the additional vaccines. If we know that they're coming, then we're in a position to start offloading the other second doses that we have, confident in the knowledge that we're getting additional vaccines very shortly. I'm happy to report to the country that having met with Vice President Harris last week, that the United States government communicated with my permanent secretary, her um, National Security Advisor communicated with my permanent secretary yesterday morning, Alice Jordan, and that the f next dose of vaccines will come, the next tranche of vaccines will come the week of November 7th, and I believe that a press release was issued today by the United States Embassy confirming the same. Pursuant to that news and that meeting which took place yesterday, we are now in a position to be able to tell the country that the Pfizer vaccines will continue as first doses tomorrow because we have enough to continue the first doses while this other group of 70,000 additional vaccines come. So believe you me, we are in a good position there. Dr. Ferdinand has already started to address the country about the need for third doses for persons over 70 and for persons who are immunocompromised and for persons who are high traffic in the middle of, 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 of the pandemic, servicing other people and who therefore need to be boosted with that third dose. The government is doing all of these things and more and shall do them and continue to do them. But I'm asking you to play your part because without you playing your part, we're going to have a lopsided response and that don't make no sense to me nor to anybody else. Um, and, and we hope, therefore, that you can work with us. I also want to make the point that I've heard a lot of people starting to question. And, and, and look, debate is healthy in a democracy, but there's a point at which we cannot continue to keep way and hoping for the worst for a nation. And I say to those who continue to question how we can have safe zones and what in the opposition they're saying is the sense of being able to put together people in safe zones, I would like for change, for us to agree that rather than having this talk about whether a safe zone can be safe or needed, and we clearly know it now with the outbreak at the psychiatric hospital and at the, in the other healthcare institutions, that I would like for them to join me and say, 
how many people we can go and vaccinate in Cory 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 um, Ford's challenge by November 15th? Join me and see how many people we can vaccinate every day. But if we fight these battles inside among ourselves, rather than understanding the common enemy that we have in COVID or the common enemy that we have in climate, believe you me, we are going to weaken our capacity to resolve these issues. And sometimes when I hear some of the persons talking, I ask myself, are they living in the same country? And do they want the same thing as, as we do? Because at the end of the day, if we want the best for Barbados, then it must be that we want to make sure that as few Bajans die and as few Bajans are hospitalized. And the science is too clear. And therefore, the safe zones are determined to drive safety. And how is safety driven? By one, reducing the chances of, of, of your dying and you're being seriously hospitalized by being vaccinated, but equally of your ability to spread it because if the contagion in you and if the virus in you, Dr. Ford, is in you for a lesser period of time because you are vaccinated, then it stands to reason that you will not be as contagious as a person who is unvaccinated in whom the virus lasts in them at a higher viral load at a much longer period of time. So that if we apply our hearts to these things and work together, to be able to get what we did between August 21st and October 21st, if we simply repeat that, if we simply repeat what we did between August 21st and October 21st, then we will be in a much better place and in a much better place to be able to continue to learn to live with this on the marathon that it has become. I believe that difficult times are made in our lives to challenge who we are. But I'm satisfied that the Barbadians that I know and the Barbadian people that have fought in the past of all other battles can do this. But I also am satisfied that we need to know that we have to get up and do it together. And when I say get up and stand up, I mean get up and stand up together, each of us as individuals and with the government there to hold our hands to carry this forward. We cannot do this by just looking at somebody else and saying, what are you doing for me? This is the one time you have to look in the mirror and ask yourselves what you're doing to protect yourself and to protect those who you love. And if we can do that, and we can roll out the safe zones, and we can roll out the vaccinations as people need them, then we will get through and we will also start to see unemployment continue to drop. It started to drop, it will drop even further. So my friends, um, I look forward over the course of the next few weeks, continuing to walk this journey with you. We are in the storm, we are not out of it. As Jeffrey has said, you will see the positivity rates going up once we start stop the and change the protocols at the airport. Do not be surprised by what you expect. I learned that lesson very early on as a young person in public life and I share it with you now because that is what helps us to get through difficult moments such as this. Um, I think we are prepared to take some questions. Minister, thank you so much. As we open for questions, I'd ask members of the media to identify themselves before posing their questions. Madam uh, Prime Minister. Good afternoon. Uh, Corville Manzi from Nation News. I am I'm not seeing anyone. I don't know if anyone can see me or hear me. We can, Colville. Okay, great. Um, basically, uh, uh, one question to Minister Bostic. You would have mentioned the fact that the positive numbers coming in from passengers traveling is, is relatively low. And, and while that is um, uh, an uncontested fact, there are some other variables that uh, have not been quite cleared as if they have been as to whether they have been answered. Uh, namely, concerns expressed around the rising cases uh, within the UK at this very moment, um, as well as the presence of an emerging variant, which is an unknown quantity. Um, could you could you also rationalize how that uh, those those two variables have been factored into your permutations? in arriving at a decision to green light uh, on vaccinated, uh, va sorry, vaccinated persons coming through our ports of entry, um, especially with the onset of the tourism winter season um, coming in at, by, next, by the next uh, month and a half. Thank you. 
Um, first of all, I think that you, you would agree with me that the, bat the immediate battle is the one that we have to be most concerned with now, although I would have indicated earlier that we are also planning ahead. Now, there's not enough data available on the new variant, as you call it, um, so we'll be guided accordingly. But this much I can say um, with certainty is that those countries, even with high rates of vaccination, that have stopped doing the basic or uh, following the basic protocols of wear masks, sanitizing, and physical distancing, you will recognize that they have ended up in problems in relation to increases in numbers. So that's the first thing. So we, there's no clarity in terms of uh, whether or not the numbers are from that source, it, coming from the UK, or indeed any new emerging threat. But we are following it very, very closely. And if we at any time have to make changes or adjustments, we shall do so. But at the end of the day, what is confronting us right now is something that cannot wait and we have to utilize the resources that we have against what is before us in the best way that we can. And obviously, as I said before, we have to use those resources where the resources are absolutely needed. Jeffrey, mm. and, and I am, Caldwell, very sensitive to why you and others may feel that way. But the ball reality is that Barbados cannot lay back and play dead nor can each of us. We have to deal with this situation that is dynamic as best we can. When you hear me talk about vaccine inequity across the world, it is largely because of the recognition that Africa, for example, has less than 5% of its population vaccinated. If Africa does not get a higher percentage, there's a distinct possibility that they too could be responsible for another variant. Latin America, similarly, has already been responsible for variants. The UK has been responsible. India has been responsible. In every instance, it is because of that lack of vaccination and the extent to which the variants develop um, with the mutations. The bottom line is, is that we can't shut down from the rest of the world. If not, what will happen is that instead of dying from COVID, we'll starve to death. And instead of dying from COVID, we'll have a lot of people literally ending up in a psychiatric hospital with mental problems. So that life was never meant to be promised as a rose garden. You understand? Remember the song, we never promised you a rose garden? Life is not a rose garden. We have to live up to the challenges as we find them. And that is why Jeffrey said, if we require to make changes to our policy again, we'll do it because we're not adamant people. From the beginning in this battle, I've given you one analogy. What has it been? Gas and brakes. Gas and brakes. And the bottom line is, the reason why we're not applying the brakes for lockdown now, and let me repeat it, one, that there is fatigue there is lockdown fatigue in this country and across the world, not just Barbados. Two, that people are already showing that they're not prepared to adhere. Um, only today we met with the British High Commissioner who reflected on the fact that even though there are recordings on the tube in London saying for people to wear their mask, that he felt unique as one of the few people on the tube wearing the mask. Okay, so it's not unique to Barbados at all. We see it in Norway, we see it in Singapore, we see it here, we see it elsewhere. But secondly, the fundamental difference is that we have 146,000 people vaccinated. And I really would like Dr. Ford to explain how, in his view, in simple language, like if you up in talking to the fellas on any block in Barbados, what does that mean by having so many people vaccinated? Because what does it do to the virus? The virus doesn't go anywhere and find people on its own. The virus moves when people carry the virus or when people go and touch something that the virus was on. And Dr. Ford, I feel that you have to find a way of explaining to the country why our ability not to have that with 146,000 people vaccinated gives us a better chance than when we had zero people vaccinated in January and when we had zero people vaccinated in April last year. Thank you.
Just one, just one second, Carville. Dr. Ford is going to give I haven't invited him to speak, sir. I just want, because I think it's better that it comes from a doctor and not just me. Give in again. Try to make it as simple as possible. So if you have a large percentage, look, straightforward. You see many countries across the globe say, look, they've not given up, you know. What they've said is, my, pop my population, everybody out there, the average person on the block, the average person at home, the average person in the village, the average elderly person, for most part, is vaccinated. And they have dropped restrictions. And what they're not seeing, what they're seeing of, yes, they're seeing an increase in amount of cases, but what they're not seeing is that overflow or a massive influx into the, into the hospitals. And that's the key. So, in short, if you get vaccinated, and most of the Barbians get vaccinated, and you live up to my challenge, do not make me look like a fool in this country. <laughs> right? I am challenging you still by the 15th of November to all get vaccinated for those who are not get vaccinated. But if you do, you know, Barbados is often very proud of many things. I'm proud of to be a Barbadian um, I'm on the ground here. And you listening to me are proud to be a Barbadian. But one of the things that we don't want to be proud about is the spring of area. So the more times a virus replicates and goes on and on and on, there's a chance that one of them could be a problem. And I think the example that was given just now is, I think is many, is, yeah, is, is very important. I think one of the major global failures, and I'll say it here again, I say at WHO meetings all the time when I'm given the opportunity, one of the major failures of the globe was to not understand the importance of just having those who are rich and able to manufacture and distribute um, uh, vaccinations to have that. I think they've finally recognized that if you don't get the rest of the world vaccinated, that something is going to spring up somewhere that will get us all back in trouble and we'll be down the rabbit hole. Us as Barbadians, you as Barbadians, you don't want to be con a contributor to that problem. I'm asking you today to step up. The average guy in the block, I speak to a lot of y'all in isolation. I, I'm a very busy man, as you might know, but I make a special effort. And someone could come on here and tell you, I make a special effort to go and talk to people even after they leave isolation. To let you know, even I say on national TV today, so you don't forget. If you had COVID, a month after, go and get your vaccinations. That's why I said the 15th, because I know how the numbers go, right? Because you can get it again. We've had cases already with reinfection. It can happen again. It doesn't happen that early, but it can happen later. I can't predict when it's going to happen, but you have to put yourself in a position that you don't make yourself sick to come in and protect old granny in the house. Do you know how many cases, straightforward, at PM, do you know how many cases I've seen in isolation? Of the nice young fella, who on the street, going out on the block and come home and bring home for granny. And I have, I'll, I'll tell you, maybe I'm wrong for saying this and forgive me, but there are many, many, of the, a lot of the, the people and all that I have, for example, in the Queens College facility, many of them are elderly people. And, and having, having, you know, being real, right? Having been um, growing up for most of my life with my grandparents, I understand that. So I'm very sensitive to anything with older people, right? Because I know who, who brought me along with my dad brought me up from young. Those are the people we need to protect. They can't protect themselves. And if you have somebody who's old in your house and you know they're at risk, a lot of the deaths were older people that we did the best we can with, are asking you, are begging you, Irish fell on the block, right? Go home and protect granny. Get vaccinated and make sure. There's some people who came and told me granny is at home. I said, granny vaccinated? No, I'm like, shame on you, right? Go and get, protect your granny at home. That's the way to think about it. Um, and I really, I, I don't know what else to tell you, but don't embarrass me come the 15th of November. Although you had a follow-up question. Again, um, let me apologize for jumping the gun uh, earlier. As I said, I'm kind of, we're flying blind on Zoom, but I'm barely hearing as well. Um, also, I just want a follow-up question re with regards to the psychiatric hospital. Uh, could you give me an idea uh, in that facility uh, you mentioned 12 members of staff that are uh, infected. Um, could you give me an idea the, the number of staff you have at the facility and how much of them with the percentage uh, that have been vaccinated as well? The 53% of the staff at the psychiatric hospital are fully vaccinated, 53 
Fantastic. <laughs> you know, 53 percent of 100 staff. How, how many staff? I, I, I can't. I can't tell you the number of staff um, right now because I don't have those numbers. But I can tell you it is 53 percent of the total staff complement of the psychiatric hospital. Mm. And we would like that number to be much higher, of course. Next question, please. Hey, good evening, Q Level Star Calm Network. Uh, my question is directed to the Minister of Health. Uh, based on Barbados's current momentum of the vaccination uptake and the existing protocols, has there been any modeling done to determine, uh, based on our current trajectory, um, we could expect to reach the peak of this surge in cases, and then like we expect to see a drop off. That work is actually ongoing. Um, we would have done some earlier work. We met, I recall Dr. Commonbatch giving some figures at, during a press conference, and I think she had indicated at that time about 500. But this is a dynamic process, and of course, all of these things will only bear fruit in terms of predictions if people do what they're supposed to do. So the longer people continue to blatantly disregard the protocols, the more issues we are likely to face. If we can get people, even at this late stage, to observe the protocols, if we can get people who may be displaying symptoms to either come and get tested or at least remain at home and make a call but don't go out and interact with people. If we could get everyone who is in home isolation to recognize the importance and their responsibility of remaining at home. Those kind of things will assist us in bringing those numbers down. But I give you the assurance that some work is in progress and as soon as we have some figures um, available that we can share, we will share with the press and the public. Minister. Mr. Minister, Trevor Thorpe, CBC. Given the recent revelation by Dr. Ferdinand about the waning effectiveness of vaccines after summons, why not open, the, open up the, the gates so that you wouldn't have those problems again, so rather than having it for X, X group and Y group and things like that? I'll take the question because I've been dealing with this. Um, the bottom line is, is that it was always understood that vaccines have a limited effectiveness in terms of lifespan um, and, and that you would always need to have boosters. Um, bottom line is, is that there is still restricted access. You have heard me speak about the fact and I want to thank, as I said, to thank the Vice President of the United States of America who has followed up and has ensured that we will be getting, as I said, the week of November 7th, the other Pfizer vaccines that we need. But that's not everything that we need. We're still waiting on the African Medical Supplies Platform. We're still waiting on COVAX. We're still looking at the additional boosters that we need from others. We saw yesterday, um, it was CDC that came out, or it was FDA, I can't remember which one in the US, that came out and endorsed max, uh, mix and match in terms of vaccines. So it is simply a question of prioritizing where the greatest need is because we still have a limited capacity in terms of, of what we have in stock. And based on the advice of the doctors, it is those persons over 71st, those persons who are immunocompromised, and those who are in high-risk jobs um, because they're exposed um, in ways that really require them to be boosted as quickly as possible. Dr. Ford or Dr. Grandison, I don't know if you want to add to that, but um, having told you that we have limited capacity, then we have to prioritize. Uh, thank you oh, for... Dr. Grandison, I apologize. It's okay. Um, certainly, yes, it is important, um, based upon the research that we are seeing, to provide um, an additional set of um, coverage for persons who may be immunocompromised. Um, we do know that there are some persons, persons, for instance, who may have had, f um, for example, a solid organ transplant, persons who may have HIV, um, that they're not being treated as well as they would like to, persons who may have autoimmune disorders, and the elderly. 
can at times not mount an adequate response. And this is not something that we know happens only with um, COVID-19 vaccines. This is something that we have seen traditionally over the history of vaccines. And that is why, for instance, um, you would have some vaccines that require a booster dose. A booster dose is essentially a top up to ensure that the immune system um, fights as quickly and engages with that foreign entity, that virus, as quickly as it should. Um, really what we are looking for when we take a, a vaccine, the immune system naturally without a vaccine in this space will at some point in time later on will sort and eventually mount a response. During that time that the actual body is trying to sort to identify what that foreign entity is, the virus is replicating. The virus's sole job is to survive at all costs, even if it means at your uh, destruction or your deficit. And so what we want is that before the virus actually comes in, we essentially have primed the immune system so that when the real virus comes into the space, because what we're doing with the vaccines is giving you either the what codes for the spike or essentially what, what looks like dead virus. And so at that point in time, we want to be able to prime person so that when the real virus comes into the space, they can certainly mount a rapid response to the virus in the space. Doing this prevents the virus from being able to replicate at the rate that is doing such, and therefore it causes a faster neutralization of the virus within the body. So for those persons who we know, for instance, who may be immunocompromised, who may not have mounted the adequate response, we want to get them first so that they have as good a protection as the person with a competent immune system. Next question. Madam. Yes, uh, final question for, from me for uh, Mark. Sorry, uh, was somebody else speaking? Yes, I was. Um, okay, go, go ahead. Yeah, Trevor Thorpe again, Madam Prime Minister. What is this costing, um, all this costing to Barbados? And, and we'll detail, I think that all of us know that last year we had to move from running a, 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 a surplus into a deficit. Um, largely because of this, we will have to go to the house again for additional funds for the Queen Elizabeth Hospital and Harrison's Point and the isolation units again shortly. Um, I can't tell you the total figure off the top of my head, but like with everything else, we will account to the country. Um, because as I said, look, somebody asked me earlier before we came to do this, how are we getting through this? by simply leading and by sharing exactly what we know with the country. And the problems come when you're trying to hide or when you're trying to, 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 to do things that you shouldn't do. We are where we are as a nation. We are no different from any other country in the world. We are probably no different from any other region in the world. Even New Zealand that thought they had managed to keep it out has now found itself with major problems again. Um, so that, believe you me, um, we will share the information as we get it, just as we've come today to you. Every time we've had a problem with an institution, we tell you we've had the problem. And I'm thankful that both Corey and Adana are both given us news of the successes because I felt that for too long also we've only been talking about those things that have been challenging, but not speaking to the fact that the majority of Barbadians, the majority of the persons who, the 14,000 people who have had COVID, have in fact recovered and are walking around and very 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 good okay but the problem with COVID is is that we don't know which one of us it will take and that's why I refer to it as COVID roulette. Colville. Good evening, I'm Mario Joseph here from Barbados today. Um, this is for the Minister of Health. Um, right now that. as we fight with the vaccine and we push the vaccine, the Merck and uh, Pfizer are developing, in fact, Merck has far advanced a pill that will deal, they say, very effectively with the virus. And in fact, Britain has already um, uh, ordered some doses. Uh, is this something uh, of the attention of the ministry here? Um, e e Emmanuel, thanks for the question, but um, 
I am in the midst of two um, doctors, uh, Dr. Ford, <laughs> Dr. Grandison, and I would rather ask one of the doctors, Dr. Ford, if he would respond to that. Thanks, Mr. Joseph. I will answer that question by like this. Anything that we have that we know there's the evidence for in managing individuals, I am sure that the people who sit next to me and above me will support the purchase of. Um, we have had um, use of, of several agents for support, certainly um, through the hospital, obviously um, through the Ministry of Health, and I'm quite sure that, that that will happen. But you might imagine, Emmanuel, that once any new drug comes out, the rest of the, it's like the vaccines, they're no different. So when new drugs come out, the rest of the world will run to purchase. And this is one of the challenges I mentioned before with vaccines, and I'm sure the same challenge is going to happen here. Those who have more and can purchase more and have the money to purchase more will be successful at getting these agents. Those who are not, often it's obviously going to be difficult, but it's not impossible because Barbados, as you might remember, was one of the first countries regionally, and certainly in Latin America, to have dosage of vaccines and to start vaccinating the public. And these are things that we need to be proud of. So thanks for the question, but I want you to always bear that in mind. Thanks. Dr. Grandison wanted to jump in here as well. Sorry about that. Thank you, Emmanuel, for that question. Certainly the drug that you are speaking about that uh, essentially Merck is, is now considering to use and they're considering it almost like a magic pill um, works very, very closely really to, to how remdesivir works. It essentially, um, the virus requires certain building blocks to make more copies of itself. Um, this particular tablet essentially is putting a lot more junk as the actual virus reads itself. And so it stops the virus from making a functional virus. And, and so that is why they certainly consider it to be, to be a game changer. Now, as Dr. Ford said, yes, um, with every single va va vaccine, drug, chemical that comes onto the market, due process must occur. But I, I am, based upon what I'm seeing, I'm, I'm certainly excited and I am sure that probably Dr. Ford is just as excited because it can be a potential game changer. And I think that once it goes through the, the requisite channels in terms of being approved, then I think it is also something that definitely um, we, will, we will try to, to endeavor to, to get for the safety of our persons. And Colville, you were trying to get back final in. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Colville. Yes, final question for me, uh, and this goes to uh, Madam Prime Minister. Um, the safe zones, uh, you, you mentioned that the health sector uh, will be the first in, in the series uh, to come. However, the business community has, has expressed some concern uh, that a wait and see approach for the others outside of the health service is, is something that is somewhat untenable for them as uh, they, they consider it, they consider uh, return of the economy, uh, reconstruction of the economy something that requires a little more urgency. Um, could you address those concerns as raised by them, please? Thank you. I'm not sure what they raised with you, but I do know that I raised here today the fact that we have to deal with getting people back to work and getting this country earning again. So I'm not sure if you want me to repeat that. I shall. Um, with respect to the safe zones, I repeat again as well that we have had one healthcare workers and healthcare institutions. But when I introduced this on the last occasion, I told you that this is a country with limited capacity and that we are going to have to do it step by step by step. I've also indicated today that after we do the healthcare um, people and healthcare workers and nursing homes on the 1st of November, that we will start rolling out the other frontline workers and the tourism and hospitality workers and tourism attractions, restaurants, going and starting from the 7th of November going forward. I want this country to appreciate that Barbados is a small country with limited resources and that we have to, the same people very often, Jeffrey, that are doing one thing are doing multiple things. And that is why I've had to be patient and to work alongside the officers in the Ministry of Health 
You've heard Dr. Ford speak about his staff over and over. Look, the, the, the thing that gives me the greatest angst at night is recognizing that these people have been working for 21 months with little or no sleep. And I know it and feel it. And I feel for the minister, I feel for the workers, I feel for the doctors, the nurses, etc. But guess what? Who has to write, help write the assessments for the safe zones? Is the same doctors? Is the same people who helping to manage in the EOC every day? Is the same people who helping to manage with the testing and the expanded things? We've tried to create a separate team on the vaccinations because of that. And that's why Major Clark and Dr. Ferdinand do that on a parallel track to the others. So the bottom line is that we are going to get there. There's one point I do want to make is this. Nothing stops the private sector for leisure time activity from requiring what they want to require in terms of testing or vaccination. The government hasn't gotten involved in that. What we have said is that we're not prepared to mandate vaccinations for work only. And if you recall from downstairs, when we were downstairs, I made the point that children, I can't promise you with children because children, the law already exists under the health services regulations to deal with vaccinations. We have to add COVID, which is being done now, but our laws already tell you that if a child is to go to school in this country, once a vaccination is available and required by the chief medical officer, that the only two ways that child can be exempted is by reason of um, medical reasons or um, if you're exempted by, by, by um, religious reasons. Okay? And it is the chief medical officer that does that, not a politician, not a teacher, not a principal. Secondly, that is relation to leisure time activity or sporting or entertainment. We spoke about the safe zone with respect to those activities and we know that we are going to go through with those groups of people what potentially can be done in order to allow them to admit people safely again. In some instances, it might be vaccination only, like it will be for cricket. The T20 cricket and the test cricket will be vaccination only and that's largely because of the requirements of dealing also with our international partners. In some other instances people may say vaccination or 24 hour tests and in some other instances in restaurants, I gave this example before, a person may decide that the last minute they want to go to a restaurant, the restaurant says vaccination or tested only, the restaurant then is in a position to test them and add the cost to the bill. If you come to a public facility, a public testing facility, we will facilitate you and give it to you free of charge because I do not feel that any Barbadian should have to pay at this point in time as long as we can continue to support them. And therefore, to go to work, safe zone, vaccination or tests, but it is the doctors who will tell us how regular the tests have to be as a result of the assessment of the particular arena within which the person is functioning or operating. Okay, It's not going to be perfect COVID, but it is going to be done systematically week by week by week because as I said, there is no post-COVID reconstruction. There is reconstruction during COVID. Are there any further questions? Uh, Mr. Trevor, again, um, there's been some uneasiness among the concerned groups with regard to the rolling back of the travel protocols. Could you clear the air on this for us? I, I think, Trevor, with all due respect, Jeffrey Bostick spoke about this eloquently at the beginning and explained to the Barbadians that for the last three months, we have not even had 1% of the person's testing coming through the borders. And therefore, you do not fight a battle where the battle does not exist. Last time I checked, are you going to go and deploy all your weaponry and infantry in an area where nobody fighting? Or are you going to go and do it where the battle is to be fought? The battle is to be fought in the communities, my brother. Someone else was trying to get in. Um, Minister Bostick, uh, Minister Bostick, um, what kind of controls, if any, are being put in place to ensure that um, Barbadians, unsuspecting Barbadians, do not buy banned, let's say, these self-testing um, kits, which we know recently found themselves on the store, the shelves of one local store. Thank you very much. Um, that particular situation that you're referring to, uh, we have responded 
responded to when we are dealing with that situation. But there, we have a list of the testing kits that are approved by the Ministry of Health and Wellness. And what we are going to do, we are going to ensure that that list is placed in the public domain so that people are aware, uh, the unsuspecting people that you're talking about. And I agree, I agree with you in that regard. And from time to time, we may make adjustments to the list based on guidance from the World Health Organization, PAHO, or the FDA, and those institutions, international institutions that we take guidance from CDC. But we will, we will put the list in the public domain, but there is an, a list of approved um, testing kits that are used in Barbados, or supposed to be used. We have time for just one more question. Hey, uh, Akil here again. Uh, my question is directed to Minister Boster or any of the doctors. The Ministry of Health issued a release this week stating that people who had COVID-19 and were placed in isolation for more than 10 days do not need to get a test after being discharged from isolation. Um, some people have been asking for clarity on this because they said when they want go to return to work, businesses are demanding that they have a negative, they produce a negative test result to return. So can you provide clarity on this? Good evening, Akil. Thanks so much for this question. This, this is a very, very important question. I, my phone, I think half of Barbados has my cell phone number. Um, I, I heard on, on, the, on the, I think it was brass stacks that somebody said to call Dr. Ford to ask for the national insurance form. And I almost fell off, the, fell off my chair. <laughs> but to answer you directly, look, in short, this virus can stay within your body in terms of getting positive for up to three months. That does not mean you're infectious. After about day 8.1, certainly into day 10, uh, um, if you have no symptoms, you're asymptomatic. And some is as far as day 13 for those who develop symptoms from the time of the onset of symptoms, those individuals become basically non infectious. And these are some mechanisms that we have used even within the isolation facilities to, to do earlier testing to try to get people out of isolation a bit earlier. But to, to explain this to the average Barbados, especially to, to corporate Barbados, because I think you need to understand this. Sending people for a repeat PCR test does not make any sense. These individuals can remain positive for up to three months, in some cases longer. And I'll give you a good example. Remember in the early part of this outbreak, when the rest of the world, including us, didn't know any better. We had people in Barbados in isolation up to 72 days of positive tests. Remember that? Just imagine that you ask your workers to get retested over and over again to get a negative test and put them out of productivity, to feeding their families, from taking care of the normal livelihood, from going, well, not going to school, not just yet. If you get vaccinated by the 50, that might happen. Going to school, doing all the lo lovely things you, you want to do, you're gradually going to deep, 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 um, you know, not help people to do that. So it's important for the average Barbian to understand that. You can remain positive on your PCR test um, for up to about three months. And this is not only Barbados. If you look at all the international um, facilities, WHO, CDC, the European, um, NHS, etc. they all say the same thing. If you're positive within the last few months, you do not repeat your PCR test. You might get lucky and it might be negative, but sometimes it's positive because they're what we call people to be, what we call chronic shedders. So they shed little pieces of virus. It is not a whole virus that can infect anyone, but your body has mashed it up. Basically, it's up there and you're picking up. You just need a little piece for your test to go positive. So, so please, for those out there who are listening, um, you don't have to call me. I, I'm going to tell you on national TV, uh, right, Akil, I'm going to tell you on national TV, there is no need to repeat people's tests again after they've test positive um, within a three-month period unless that person has developed new onset of symptoms. There have been only a few cases internationally of persons who had repeat infections in that early phase, but they usually, not usually, they always really present with symptoms. So in the absence of that, it, it's really a senseless, senseless event. Thank you. Prime Minister, I'll give you closing comments. Thank you very much. Um, as I said earlier, I really want to encourage every Barbadian to encourage everyone around them. Each one of you, protect yourself, protect the ones that you love. And particularly those of us who have children who are teenagers, 
please make sure that you protect them as well because we do not want even though they have a better chance of fighting off the virus as we know they can still be seriously affected and regrettably we lost one young person last year I do not want to see us lose any more I also want to encourage persons we are working as hard as we can with respect to the NIS claims as you heard we're trying to see how we can see if that can be done more in batches and electronically because we are conscious that persons who are not at work may have to receive those monies in order to be able to survive particularly since all of the employers may not necessarily have the cash flow to pay for you and a substitute my friends this is not 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 an easy situation but it is not an impossible one as it relates to the directives the directive remains the same for tomorrow the only real difference is going to be to empower us to bring out the directives dealing with the safe zones which we expect to do in the next few days and therefore the empowering directive allows us to do that um, I just really want to say look we need to be conscious that among us we have people who are working beyond the call of duty it is our duty now to meet them as well where they are and to ensure that if we can minimize the extent to which each of us can become seriously ill then we minimize the extent to which Dr. Ford and Dr. Grandison and all of the other doctors and nurses and orderlies and people doing transport etc are working flat 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 out we know the numbers will increase I want to repeat myself the numbers will increase the positivity will increase in the middle of a storm but equally, we know that typically storms don't last for more than 12 weeks, I'm told. So that we need to continue to stay the course. We've been going through this for quite a few weeks now. We're in the middle of it. We can make it. And as Jeffrey keeps saying, there shall be no surrender and no retreat. But let us do it, applying our hearts to wisdom and recognizing, please, that each one of us must protect ourselves and those that we love. Thank you and God bless you and God bless this country. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prime Minister, the Honourable Mia Amor Motley. I would also like to thank the Minister of Health and Wellness, Lieutenant Colonel the Honourable Jeffrey Bostick, the Infectious Disease Specialist and Isolation Facilities Manager, Dr. Corey Ford, Consultant Manager of Home Isolation, Dr. Adana Grandison, members of the media and you for joining. Good evening.